think Math for Wisdom is a wonderful adventure into trying to connect mat mathematics with ancient wisdom or, you know, inherited wisdom. Um, yeah, and seeing the, the common patterns. John Brett, who you just heard, is one of the participants of Math for Wisdom, who I featured in the video. Welcome to Math for Wisdom. John and his wife Yoshimi are the creators of a metaphorical framework, emergently, for appreciating diversity, interdependence, and synergy. I recorded a long conversation with John. I share with you the first part where he talks about Math for Wisdom as an adventure. I hope it can be an adventure for you as well. Join John and me and Kirby Erner and a few others at the Math for Wisdom discussion group. I am Andrus Kulikauskas, and this is Math for Wisdom. So, and the idea is that this recording is in the public domain, you know, copyright sure. free for without restriction. So, I'm very glad you, you know, you, 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 you like that. And the three questions I want to ask you about uh, the first will be what does Math for Wisdom mean for you? Because mm -hmm. I'm making this new video, which is based on the reality. <laughs> the reality is like, you know, we have maybe six participants in different ways. So, so you yeah. are very real. So, that's why the first question, that's very good feedback. The second question, which is part of this learning process, especially though with Kirby, you know, he's very friendly, but like it turns out like when you have a chance to engage a real human being, you realize like, wow, like we're different. So like the colors that I see, he's colorblind too, let's say, right? Like so, and it's just a, like, and so the color I'm talking about, you know, are the sounds that I hear, he, they're off his range, you know, of sounds. So, uh, and the reason is because all my life, let's say, I've been tuning into this concept of absolute truth, you know. So I think most, my feeling, maybe just to say, like, most common people, you know, have a notion of absolute truth. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. What happens, though, is that, like, he has a degree in philosophy, you know, so, which is, you know, so that just gets completely, like, eliminated, Um in not just, I mean, certainly in philosophy, like, you know, any conception of absolute truth would just get, it just doesn't belong there. But I think that's true probably for academics in general. So like, if you have a bachelor's degree, I would say, well, you can just, you know, it never maybe, and you, and you don't get a philosophy course or anything, you know, you just get by and you can have opinions about absolute truth. Like, I think a typical opinion is like, it's probably there. I have no, kind of with God, you know, like this kind of agnostic thing, you know, could be something there, I don't know, right? But in, if you have a master's or a PhD or whatever, I think the the, the academic environment is that, no, like these are things are unprofessional. The whole thing just does not, like, you know. And so I have spent my whole life independently developing this, you know, and I just kind of assume. Can you hear me? Come on in. He's we're just talking. He's just telling me what. A we're just talking. <laughs> Hi, Yoshimi. <laughs> Come up? I've seen no. you from your videos. I know you. <laughs> so. Did you want to? Um, no, probably not. That's okay. Right. okay. Nice meeting you. Nice I've been telling you. her all about you because uh, it's been a fascinating journey for me. Mm. Okay, so so I'll record. Oh, anyway, so just to make a long story short, like this nice person, friendly person, Kirby, one of the very few people who will engage me. You know. Yeah just doesn't understand what I'm all about. You know, we spent half a year together and it's after half a year, I realized like, he doesn't, like, I I just assume I'm into absolute truth. You know, I didn't even think about it, you know, but he doesn't see it. Anything related to absolute truth, he will not see. And so he just kind of moves on to it. And I keep trying to come back to certain things. He just doesn't see them. So he just ignores them, you see. So the end result was, uh, I had never verbalized this mentally or whatever, but I just realized like, See, my, my deepest value is living by truth. Yeah. And people would say, oh, that's your personal truth. I go, no, 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 it's not my personal truth. But the absolute truth, which is, you know, very paradoxical and challenging. But so um, then I realized, like, what is math for wisdom? It's for a scientific community for absolute truth. And so the wisdom is the content and the math is the form. And so they're related, you know, and to use that relation. But it's really about neither. It's about absolute truth. 
And so just kind of click, see, I'm just saying, that's how I benefit. Like, it just takes one or two people, you see. Yeah. And you kind of like elevated the discourse with Kirby because now all of a sudden there's a third person, you know, there's a third wheel. So yeah. so now all of a sudden we can start to be more, per, you know, like, and I, you can see it's a little bit challenging socially and I don't maybe have, but I think I have some social skills where I can, yeah. you know, where, like, how do you wrestle with that? And he is very kind. So, okay, anyway, so what does absolute truth mean for you? I will ask, and then um, because I'm realizing I need to ask a lot of people because uh, it's it's interesting for me. It's very relevant. Yeah. Then the then the third thing would be, and I don't know, but uh, I like to try to focus on not what we know, like with Kirby. You know, he'll tell me everything he knows, and it's just not in a certain sense not really helpful. Like you know, but and I'm a monster in a certain sense. But like for me, the monster, like you know, tell me what you don't know. You know, and then I have something to devour, you know, because I have this mind right. that wants to deal with these things, right? Like you tell me what you know, I just have to kind of like throw it away. But if you tell me what you don't know, then and then we can work as equals, whatever, like, you know. So right. you gave me a question. And so my question is, how would you investigate the question you gave? You know, maybe you have another question, but how can we change the way we think so that we integrate known science, but also the way nature really operates so that'd be the third and not to answer that but to make like an investigative plan like is that how would you is that and do you have any other topics or or is that enough for did you have anything you wanted to i think that's that? enough yeah i mean I, so you know, I can go i can go on forever on um and just maybe your time constraint what is your time um what what, what? i'm okay it's, uh, it's like half an hour or an hour like an with within yeah, an, now well, i guess we'll be kicked off in 30 minutes so Oh, so, you know, but then if we want to, then we, we use the same link. It's just a Zoom. Right, okay. it's 40 minutes. Sure. So then question number one, what does Math for Wisdom mean for you? I think Math for Wisdom is a wonderful adventure into trying to connect mat mathematics with ancient wisdom or, you know, inherited wisdom. Um yeah, and seeing the the common patterns. Mm -hmm. And what do you what do you think of as ancient wisdom? Well, I, you know, so I'm I'm here in New Zealand, so we have mm -hmm. uh, quite a strong Maori culture, and of course they have a very um, definite um, creation story mm -hmm. compared to um, you know kind of the the Einstein and you know. Um, well, the British scientists, American scientists, have created a um, a, a um, an, another version of the creation of the universe, and um, they actually match pretty well. If you mm -hmm. if you allow for the fact of communication is a metaphor for what mm -hmm. is really out there, what what has really happened, um, and actually for me. I've sort of finally realized that um, actually our brains only work in metaphor. Mm -hmm. So when we're visual, when we're looking, we're seeing a three-dimensional moving image. Now I call it space-time. I like to call reality space-time because you can't have space without time, and you can't have time without space. Mm -hmm. And they, and thanks to Einstein, we do know now that they actually bend. Um, they're not necessarily static. Whereas I think in a, you know, a few hundred years ago, we used to think everything was static and things moved around in a predictable way, but it's a much more complicated universe now we understand than we used to. Um, so that three dimensional image is actually captured by a two dimensional retina. Our, our eye ca captures a two dimensional two-dimensional version of it and then our brain constructs our consciousness out of that so it's all metaphor in there it's trying to say it's like this you know out there and so when you say absolute truth to me what you're you're saying is you're going to create words or mathematical symbols that are metaphors for what we experience the real experience and then when i look at what we can experience and what we can't experience there's this kind of what 
uh, this tuning where we can tune in like a radio, you know all of those frequencies are there, but you can only tune in to one frequency at a time. So our tunability understanding of the of of reality of everything that's going on is only very narrow so there's a lot <laughs> huge amount that's going on that we have no sense of um so then if so then if we go back to the flat earth days when people used to think the earth was flat and that was fine when you only walk you know a few hundred miles or something the concept of absolute truth um, was very different. Nowadays, we have X, Y, Z coordinates, and we know about spheres, and we're 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 ro rotating around the sun, and we have a much more complex view of absolute truth. Um, and I've come across a thing that really intrigues me about Kirby's point of view is his understanding of quadrays, which is Basically, instead of X, Y, Z right angle triangles, which are all totally independent, so you can move in one dimension and none of the other dimensions change. And I look out there into into um, nature, and I don't I don't see independence. I see you change one thing, you change everything. It's independent, interdependent. Sorry, everything is interdependent. And the beauty of the quadre dimensions is you can move in any one dimension and all of the other dimensions change the coordinates and the other dimensions so i was thinking you know many years ago people used to think absolute truth in terms of two dimensions now we're thinking of absolute truth in three dimensions but they're independent dimensions maybe we need to update our worldview and I haven't figured this out, but I think Kirby is onto something. <laughs> and I think the fact that you're seeking absolute truth, um, there has to be a way to accommodate all of this. Um, there, maybe we need to update the way we think to allow for interdependence. Um, and actually, Yoshimi and I have made a career out of doing a, um, mm -hmm. a behavioral model that's based on interdependence and avoiding opposites. So it's based on these four triangles. So you can see they're all different, but when you fold them up, you can see that they're related. Each face touches every other face and there are no opposite faces. And so we tried to use that as a tool, as a bridge from thinking in kind of pieces, a typical way of thinking, breaking things down into pieces Mm -hmm. and typically polar opposites. So this is great because you've got uh, outside, two outside triangles and two inside triangles. You've got two triangles facing down, two triangles facing up. Oh, this is great. Um, and two on the left and two on the right. And actually, it actually, um, that coincides with preferences in, in terms of behavior, externally focused, internally focused, conceptual, practical, or, you know, more left brain, um, theoretical, right brain, imaginative. That works really well. And then we fold it back up here and say, remember, we're actually all four of these, but you might only see one at a time. You might have a preference of going, of, and you might be perceived this particular way, but you've got all these others hidden all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's a way of thinking in terms of whole systems and interdependence, as opposed to the X, Y, Z, where we're in most behavioral things where they force you to make choices, polar opposite choices. So you're either this or that, you're either good or bad, and let's look at your strengths and weaknesses. Everything's polar opposites. But if you, but if you, um, if you fold up your tetrahedron, right, like you had uh, yeah. your tetrahedron, and you are... Uh... You look at the center of the tetrahedron, right? Yeah. See, this is a this is the way, like in my mind, a little bit how it looks. Like I'm in the middle. I don't think visually in terms of. Um, I don't really believe in reality, you know, so to speak. Like I just I have in my own life, you know, so internally. Sure. But I can be, and this isn't exactly like this, but because uh, it's still too visual. But like imagine being inside the tetrahedron, 
and that mm -hmm. each of the triangles is like a window. Yeah. Right. I'm on the see. I I don't I, I don't look on the outside of a tetrahedron. Like I imagine I'm in the inside of a tetrahedron. I'm in a mental prison, yeah. but I see four windows. Let's say, or usually I think of doors. Oh. Let's say. I see like four doors, yeah. right, or four windows, yeah. right. See, so that relates to me now. Those yeah. are the choices I have. Do you see? Yeah. Like and, I don't. And the point is that when you look out this window, mm -hmm. there's another window right next to it. And there's another window right next to it. And there's another window right next to it. And there are no other windows. Yeah, so I see Whereas four windows. If you're I mean, in a cube, there's a window over there, and there, and there, and there, and there. Right. And then there's another window right, right behind you, opposite of it. That's a very different perspective. It, it is. And so maybe to say, um, you know, and I... I'm more interested in what you have to say than in what I'm saying. Although, you know, I was like, to, yeah. but I think just to kind of relate it to how I see, like, I don't believe in any of that uh, thing outside. Like, I'm not responsible for it. Uh, if it changes tomorrow, I was not invested in it, you see, like, but I was invested in knowing my, the shapes inside, you see. Right. So I start from the other thing. I don't start from the model. Like, I mean, I appreciate those models because sure. that's where I'm ending up. But I, I never try to start from them. I try to say, what is the prison in my mind in a particular situation, like a particular mental state? What are the options? And so sometimes there's two and sometimes there's three and sometimes there's four and sometimes oh, there's five. You see, and so in each case, but then the question is, what is the shape of those options? And so, you know, it's difficult and I use different uh, ways to kind of sort it out. And it's, you know, kind of tentative, but the idea is to say, they have different shapes. And mm -hmm. I draw graphs. Like, so Kirby, I he says, you use a lot of diagrams. You like to see, I don't think in terms of diagrams. I think in terms mm -hmm. of those spaces. But when I have to draw them right. down, they look like a diagram. But okay, because so he doesn't see that, you know, he says, oh, you draw oh, no, diagrams. I think he does. So I make the distinction um, about abstract, the idea, mm -hmm. and how things appear appear in reality. So right. our our uh, model, for example, um, of behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have the abstract idea of behavior. So um, this one here is is um, is Earth, mm -hmm. um, and so we say Earth is firm, mm -hmm. um, and it's okay. So here's here's the abstract stuff. Okay, it's um, it's over on the left side, so it's more left brain. It's based down. It's more practical, mm -hmm. and it's on the outside, so it's more e externally focused. All right, that's very abstract. But when we're talking about behavior of real people, then we have to remember that this uh, our map. This is a map. This is a context. Mm -hmm. um, the context for uh, you know for looking at people is this is a metaphor. We have to remember the metaphor is limited, and we can often make quite um, dangerous assumptions based on the metaphor because we've taken the metaphor too far. And, and this is to remind us that the reality, the physical, this, I would say four dimensional, but let's stick with convention, three dimensional reality is much more complex. Um, and in fact, well, even though we were thinking in terms of opposites, um, the reality is very different. It doesn't have opposites. Um, and I, and I, I, I make the analogy with music as well. Mm -hmm. So you can have a CD of music and it, the music is encoded in binary. Mm -hmm. So you can you can define music very precisely in with zeros and ones, mm -hmm. you know, they're polar opposites. But if you want to hear it, very different physics, very mm -hmm. different properties right. of of uh, of music. So, our conception of some of reality can be digital, can be you know, our abstract concept mm -hmm. can be um, can be whatever, whatever helps whatever is a good metaphor for what is reality.
And what I love about what you're doing is you're very uh, clever at seeing patterns in numbers and then relating those patterns. These are abstract patterns, mm -hmm. abstract patterns to abstract patterns in real life, like poetry. For example, yeah. Did you see right. that video or not? Or, or no? Or, um, uh, I, I had a bit of it. It was a bit okay. over my head, but... That's fine, but I mean, you know, not many people watch the video, so <laughs> thank you for yeah. watching them. But I was wondering if you could expand on that in the sense of like math for wisdom. You talked about it as a conception, but I'm interested as a community. You know, you can see there's a tiny microscopic yeah. community that you know you yeah. are very kindly uh, participating in. And so, what does that community mean for you? Like, how would you describe it, or how would you? Uh, what is it? What's the significance for you? Um, well, actually, you know, for me, I've expressed before that um, my life has been an adventure. So I, I mm -hmm. tend to like, and, and that's what's so intriguing about absolute truth is that's mm -hmm. not an adventure. That's look, looking for a, a definite destination. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you know, you do have to go on an adventure to find it. Um, so it's just a different kind of adventure. But um, I love adventures where I have no idea where I'm going to end up, but I like the process. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Um, and so, for example, I'm wearing my uh, uh, she's in is the name of our boat, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's it's the Japanese word for nature, oh. because we love nature. Um, so, you know, and Yoshimi and I met um, for, um, yeah, forty odd years ago um, on a sailing adventure, mm -hmm. sailing from New Zealand, in theory, to Japan, but we. We only got halfway and flew the other half. Oh. Um, but we've been on an adventure ever since. And to me, this is a this is an adventure because we I don't know where I'm going to end up. But the key thing, you know, that like I explained the idea of maybe we need to update our worldview in terms of X Y Z coordinates, um, and instead start thinking more in terms of interdependence. Mm -hmm. And maybe the quadre mathematics mm -hmm. will help us discover patterns that we hadn't noticed before um, that make so much more sense when we look at it through a quadre lens as, as opposed to an XYZ lens. Uh, and then it starts to get into math, you know, very quickly into mathematics that's mm -hmm. way beyond me. But you guys, um, you can do it. And you, you see those p potential patterns and the geometries uh, and then there's the, this one other thing, too, that's very mm -hmm. exciting for me, and that is um, there's, a, there's a physicist, Basil Hiley, who's mm -hmm. doing mathematics. He's researching mathematics of the quantum potential um, to try and uh, – and he's, he's making progress. But, it, again, it's, it's an adventure. He doesn't know if it's going to end up anywhere, um, but it's got a lot of promise. And that – that opens up the possibility of our uh, worldview encompassing not only our physical reality, our physical, um, you know, stars and planets and galaxies and what have you, but opens up the possibility of starting to understand consciousness and the rules, the absolute truths by which all of our reality is unfolding. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was the other thing that I got really excited about is because he uses the term, um, the terms how the the conceptual or the um, abstract mm -hmm. <clears throat> rules of the universe exist, and they unfold into uh, reality that we experience just like this does. So if mm -hmm. you can imagine, this is a represent a metaphor for the uh, the consciousness or the the rules of the universe or God, whatever you like, mm -hmm. I don't know what to call it. I, could, I yeah, I don't know what to call it. Um, and then for particular space and time, wow, suddenly it goes like this. But the only way it can be like this is because it existed like this in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, all it's done is it's unfolded. So it it has these these properties briefly and then it folds back up again and it, it 
it always had those properties. And and um, but it's not always present. We don't always experience it, but it always had those properties. So that's what he was trying to show with this quantum potential is mm -hmm. that there's a mathematical formula that can explain some of the quantum physics mm -hmm. um, that we that the physicists are finding that make no sense in terms of our X, Y, Z and normal view, version of reality. So there's that potential to, um, well, consciousness to really evolve in understanding the physics of the relationship between the absolute truth and the physical truth. And what what is that physicist's name again? I was very glad that you introduced, you know, him to our... Awareness. Yeah, Basil Hiley. Basil Hiley. Mm -hmm. H-I-L-E-Y. Yeah, uh, and um, he's, he's a, um, a proponent of David Bohm's physics. Um, so he was a physicist a while ago. He's, uh, I think he died a few decades ago. Uh, but he wasn't, mm -hmm. he was never very popular. Um, but he, he coined the the, the, the terms implicate order and explicate order. Mm -hmm. now, both of these exist and they, the implicate, uh, implicate order unfolds into the explicate order, which is what we experience. And then the explicate order folds back into the implicate order. Mm. Um, I want to say, you know, I mean, at this point, like every person is precious to me because like, yeah. you know, just simply by the laws of numbers, laws of small numbers, or whatever, that there's so few, you know. So I um and I sometimes feel like almost reckless, like you know, to uh take someone like Kirby and to <laughs> kind of like you know shake him around. <laughs> like a right. like a but um but but I feel I see maybe good enough to feel like that's you know that that maybe is a you know he's very kind. Uh and so um and actually just to praise him, like he's the one person, like, you know, he is the public spirit, you know, of math for wisdom in the sense like, you know, for example, you came because yeah. of me engaging him, you know, when he gave his talk yeah. and you were there and right. you see, that's his gift. Uh, and, but it was also his gift. Like I challenged him quite, um, you know, quite strongly and it was not very comfortable for him, but, um, but it, it somehow it all managed to be in the spirit, you know, and I think something clicked, you know, with, and so one of the things I did, you know, which I guess I'll return to is like, I wanted to know the questions, right? Like, so when they present Buckminster Fuller's, this, it, it's often in terms of all the answers he had, but those are all like dead ends, so to speak. No, but but it turns out, at least for that. me, um, but, but I just want to say, but to flip it around, you know, and ask people, and it was a beautiful thing that, um, uh, uh, the um, the leader of 52 Living Ideas, he ran with that. But to say, okay, we ended up like with uh, 12 people giving 12 different questions that he asked. You see, and the idea is that if we had that program, you see, and you took it to a high school or you took it to a business, you said, there's this program of 12 questions. You see, they're the Buck Minister full of questions, right? Well, see, that would be very um, open and like in, in inviting for people. But the way it gets communicated, although that's pro those questions are the essence, but it's communicated as if they had been answered, you know, by the Dymaxion car, you know, or by this or by that. And it's like, you, do you see it? It's kind of answered that they, these are examples of um, some principle or some idea that he, he talked about. Um, the, the, I think what I'm just saying as an outsider, like they should sure. be, the, he created them as examples. But see, now that he's gone, it's like those examples have been converted unintentionally, like into answers, like it's the end, like to say, just forget about all that. But let's keep I with the questions. I don't understand how you end up that way. But hmm, well, I'm just enough. saying as an outsider like yeah. this, because I don't hear people saying we have this question. See, the way it would work, like um, if those questions were genuine, People would just say, yeah, none of this matters, but the question matters. And this is how we're pursuing the question. These are, so a little bit uh, exciting about what Kirby does is that he does run with the question further. Like, so he pursued this quadre thinking in a way that, you know, above and beyond what Buckminster Fuller did. How many people can say that, that they've kind of taken it beyond what he did? You know, it's not. Well, that I thing. think we have. And with and our, you have, right. With our, um, 
uh, actually our last last video that we did uh, there, which, and we actually, oh, you you saw it where I we saw large we parts tried of it. Tried yeah. to make a tetrahedron, and and the Buckminster Fuller doesn't make a a strong. He never talks about interdependence very much, mm -hmm. and he doesn't make the point explicitly that you have to have diversity to create synergy. He demonstrates how to create synergy by one plus one equals four with the triangles, where you we twist um, one of the one of the um, arms of a triangle. If you have an arm, a triangle and you twist it, mm -hmm. if if you have two triangles twisted the same way, they they won't create a tetrahedron. But if you have one twist one way right. and the other one twists the other way, mm -hmm. then you can put them together to make it to make synergy. Well, he never made the point mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that in order to create synergy, you must A have diversity and B interdependence. So you can have these two things, but if they don't try and get together, uh, you know you're not going to get synergy. If they're if they're you know fighting each other, um it's not you're not going to get synergy so if you have the difference mm -hmm. the diversity like you know ukraine and russia right if you can find a way if you if you just want to dominate like mm -hmm. we started to do with the with the original mm -hmm. um with the little skit that we did uh you get nowhere yeah i saw the skit but if you mm -hmm. try and find a way to work together mm -hmm. taking each other's strengths playing to each other's strengths then you can create synergy so that's why i think you know there's such great potential with you and and with your mathematical background and kirby with his mathematical background very different there's the diversity now if we can find a way to to work together there's bound to be an unexpected, fantastic result that's twice as good as we were hoping for in the mm -hmm. first place. And so um, I think that speaks to like what I'm discovering about this math for wisdom, you know, in terms of like how it drives me like, and it's a bit unexpected because, um, yeah, because math is such a narrow thing. I mean, math is such a narrow discipline that very few people get to climb very far on. You know, I mean, it's a very daunting yeah. ladder. And it's just, I mean, it's, and it is a kind of like a ladder sometimes. It shouldn't be a ladder, but it's just, you know, you, and people are afraid of heights, let's say to speak. It's just the whole thing yeah. is not very, uh, you know, it's dubious. But um, but to say that uh, your participation, there's another, um, Bill Paul, for example, he has like a high school level. But the idea is that he watches lots of videos, but he's willing to be tutored. You see, and he's willing to try with things he doesn't know. And I'm just amazed, um, like how that is opening things up. So, for example, from you, uh, this uh, physicist, highly in the potential there, right? Like, well, that very much resonates with the quantum physics that I get to talk about with uh, John Harland and Thomas Guy Dawson. We're high level, like, you know, that it's relevant, right. you see, and yeah. not right now, but like in the few months when hopefully like I have more results to show but to go yeah. to this uh, uh, um, bezel highly and show, hey, we have these results and they may be relevant for what you're doing, you see. And so mm -hmm. maybe we could have, you know, a connection. Here we'll conclude uh, this part of the conversation. If you'd like to hear more, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, leave comments, join our discussion group, and uh, support me through Patreon. Thank you for caring about math for wisdom.